Okay, my friends, every day, same stuff every day, 8.7 million year old fossil. Well, where do they come up at 8.7 million years old, first of all? Secondly, this is nothing. If they think this changes the long accepted ideas of human origin, I'll show you what really <laughs> changes them. Okay, my friends, I've been showing mud fossils, and I have books now coming out, Introduction to Mud Fossils and Geology, and I have the school going, and they are still clinging to these ideas that are just not correct. 8.7 million year old fossil ape challenges long accepted ideas of human origin. Well, what about my notos, which have springs inside of them? They are feet, but they are not like our feet. Let me show you this, and I have, my stuff is DNA tested and CAT scanned and everything else, and they refuse to engage because I discovered giant human beings. Okay, before we go further, this is about Yale University, which I presented all my research to them years before this. In October 2016, they took credit for my research and made this paper about about these Etocarda biota. All that means is creatures in a layer they call Etocara. Well, all it is is a thin layer because of a global worldwide flood, and that's exactly what they say. It says that there was a, a worldwide flood, and uh, the chemistry in the ancient oceans, they don't understand it, why this chemistry in the ancient oceans, which was one ocean surrounding the entire world for a short period of time. And they say that, yes, these fossils could have happened almost instantaneously, and many of them are outright bizarre in appearance, do not resemble any organism alive today. This is a postdoctoral from, yeah, from Yale, Lydia Tara, and she says, um, was it a failed evolutionary experiment? Yes, it was. It, the earth was flooded to get rid of all these giants and huge creatures that I have presented, and I have the evidence and the DNA and all that. She says right here, uh, that it could have happened right here. It enabled the transformation of the sand around the animals and, and turned them into rock to occur over a matter of hours or years rather than the usual time frame, thousands to millions of years. So they, they have totally, completely validated what I said. And here is the paper they wrote, very exceptional preservation of soft-bodied creatures. Biota means creatures. Etikara means a layer promoted by silica-rich oceans. And I understand why the silica was there. It was because of a hot water flood and the silica uh, I mean, uh, the uh, phosphorus turned down to silica. I understand everything about it, and I presented this to Yale, and this is what they did. And this is the kind of stuff that nobody's, nobody's talking about this worldwide flood. They are, but they put it in a little paper and sort of hid it in the background. I pr presented this all over the world, but nobody will listen because Yale had turned me down and would not allow my research to be seen. Well, they wouldn't look at it. Let me put it that way. And as soon as they say, no, it's just, it's just crazy, the guy's crazy, well, everybody else says I'm crazy, too. And then they took credit for it. But they don't have any DNA tests. They don't have any specialty things, which I do. I have all the DNA tests. I have all that stuff. Here's a DNA test right here. And this was done from a very, very good lab who got assaulted for doing this. They all did. But... I'm sorry, I sent my samples to them, which are little bits and pieces that I extracted, which was literally blood. And this goes back to 2015. Yale did theirs in 2016. They took credit for my work and said, yes, this could happen instantly. Crazy creatures, and they were. This, this lung right here was part of the DNA-tested stuff. And then there was two giants a mud tip and a 36 inch tip and it was all this is very very high quality test all pcr all kinds of extractions and it's way beyond my capability and it had to be done in a lab and a very good lab and they did a fabulous job and they were excellent to work with look at this excellent quality dna sequence obtained for the 36 inch tip and the lung this lung and the 36 inch tip of absolutely fabulously blood homo sapien mitochondrial dna let me show you the two samples all right this fingertip is approximately three feet long the fingernail is still there you can see that little fingernail coming around here there's the pad that goes between the the fingers the, the uh, bones so that they don't scrub blood supply vein and artery I broke this piece off so I could get inside because you can't get blood from the outside really really outside you got to go inside to get the blood 
and that's what I did. And that's approximately three feet long from here to the very end of the tip. I told you I broke a piece off. There it is right there. It's the fingerprints, literal fingerprints. Those are the sweat pores. These are the ridges. My thumb is approximately the same width as one fingerprint ridge. So this was a very, very large creature. But I have even parts from bigger creatures. But still, this was the fingertip grip skin. It's this stuff right here. You see this keratinized cell? You can't get any blood out of there. There's virtually no blood in there. But in, down inside, it's saturated with blood. And that's where I went and took literally raw red blood out of there. All right, this is what this these are fingers and these are the vein or the artery comes down with the blood and the vein sucks it back So it's one or the other coming down and there's two holes on the sides of each side and two on the tips That's how you're constructed and then they filter over the artery blood into the vein and sucks it back get all recharged That's where I got the blood out of deep inside If anybody ever told you you can't get blood out of a rock they are totally wrong that is a bone, it was one like this, I don't know if this was the one, I can't remember, but it, it had, as soon as you take it out of the ground and it gets unimpacted from the mud, sometimes it'll leak out, and sometimes if it's a lung, it'll leak all over the place. Now this one here, had the scab came out, and I went back and I looked into that scab area, and um, this was I moved the scab off of the fiber and this is called fiber and it's a clotting fiber it's just like you have in your own body and it, it collects the cells and then they turn into a scab and then when everything's fixed it falls off but there's a vein and an artery underneath here and here they are all right the black one you see that little tube black coming down to here that's the vein, uh, vein. this is the artery the red one I show it all the time, and that's what came out of that rock. So don't tell me you can't get blood out of a rock. That is incorrect. All right, this was the one I showed you. That's this one here, and again, flat as a pancake, because they died in the Great Flood. Exactly what what Yale says. I agree with 100%. No, they agree with me, actually. <laughs> I presented all this to them. Anyway, that's the lung, and they still won't accept any of this. This one here leaked blood out of it. You see these these spots here? All those little red spots? Blood actually came out of some of them. Not all of them, but uh, quite a few of them. Now, these are the alveoli, which are the holes that are in your lung. All right, you breathe in. <sighs> And you end up getting air all in there, and then it moves into the, the blood, which is the blood is everywhere in your lung. I mean, it's just saturated with blood. And it, the, it, oxygen gets into your system through this blood. Now, this lung was, let's say it was just like this lung, all right? But this one here, for some reason, this one kept all its pleura, that's all the rubbery stuff around the lung. And this one, all that stuff went, you got all the way down into the alveoli. But what happens is, this was saturated with blood. And it's tipped this way. All the blood ran down to this side. And that's why this is empty up here. And it's filled up with silicates. And that's why they say it was silica-rich oceans. And I understand why the silicates were there. It's because of the phospholipids in the membranes. I understand all of this. I've been doing this for many, many years now. And that's even a goose. And a goose has the same phospholipid membranes. Every cell has a phospholipid membrane, and that's what causes the silica. And these, everything has a cell, every, every, even your blood cells have phospholipid membranes. There's a membrane between everything, and even feathers on a goose. See the feather pattern? He's, he died too, just like that. And this is where his throat would have gone. See it? Coming right up here. He died laying like that. I understand this fully. So it's time to, to, to really go and look at this meaningfully. Right now, it's just, I'm being avoided because it's too much for them to accept. And I'll show you why, because of the giants. I think I already showed you the giant fingertip. Let me show you the giant hand. 
and then I'll show you something even bigger. All right, this is a giant hand, and it's about three and a half, four feet wide, somewhere around there. I can't remember. This is many years ago, and I had this. I had I found fingertips, knuckles, all kinds of things from this this hand, and I actually had this CAT scan and DNA tested, and it came back human, same as the other ones. This was one of the third. Now, remember I talked about the grip skin and how that little flat piece of skin, whoops, where did I go back here? All right, when I talked about that little flat piece of skin falling off, this is grip skin. Same thing on your hands, hands and feet, same thing. The skin just falls right off after it's dead because it's just like a layer that lays on top of there. And again, I showed you that. Hold on. All right, this is the easiest way to do it. I'm just going to shuffle through the pictures. That is the grip skin from that huge finger, three feet long, just one fingertip. That guy would have been close to 200 feet tall. And they were proportional to us, it appears. Now, this was a hand. Remember, that's the grip skin. This is the same grip skin stuff, but this is obviously the palm of the hand. And I showed you the fingertip from it. And what else do I have here? And you saw the blood coming out of the rock and the blood coming out of here. Now, I got some other stuff up here about light. We're going to be going into that. That's a whole other issue because there's so many things that are wrong now. And this is the new atomic theory, the dipole electron flood theory. And I'll explain to you exactly how this works in the next video about light. All right, this is a problem of science. This was done years ago. This is, this is from 2021, but it was long before that. They predicted that light was, was part of matter, and it is. And I can, I absolutely can guarantee this because something, and heat is matter as well. Heat actually adds weight to something. Did you know that? Everybody thinks heat makes things rise. No. If you heat up something that is, is a solid, it will make it heavier. And I know this for an absolute fact because I was, I used to do weights and measures with um, electronic scales and we had to calibrate them and the weights had to be tested. And one time I took the weights up to be tested up to the weights and measures place and they said, you got to leave them overnight. And I said, for what? Why can't you just test it now? You're not doing anything. <laughs> and the guy said, it doesn't matter. You got to leave them overnight because they got to be the same temperature as everything else. And they said, well, what does that got to do with it? He said, nobody knows. <laughs> he said, but we know they don't weigh right if one of them's cold and one of them's hot and warmer. He said, they both got to be the same temperature, ambient temperature. So anyway, I, I, so I always wondered about that, but I went back and thought it over. And heat is nothing more than particles. Heat is excessive particles in something. And I'll show you some other evidence to support that, but I won't do it in this video. This video here was just to tell you that everything in science right now is it needs to be at least a re-examined. History is just totally wrong. Geology is completely wrong. You know, atomic, subatomic physics, as far as I'm concerned, is absolutely totally wrong. Particles are made out of tiny dipoles, and that's why you have all kinds of isotopes. They never even considered isotopes. Isotopes, there's a zillion different half-lives for every different type of atom. Why? Why does that atom have all these different other isotopes along with it? Just take one more little piece off, another little piece off, another little piece off. It's still the same, same thing. But when they do these collider things, they don't even think about these little pieces. Right now, we've got to start over again. So that's what we're going to do. You see this? This is the other thing that drives me crazy. These are the same particles that they found at CERN and Fermilab. And I went to, to University of Geneva. I showed them all this stuff. Nobody disagreed with it. These are the muons. These are the electron neutrinos. And they come from dipole electrons. Now, the other thing was, is space empty? Well, maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't. Well, here they claim about the quantum foam. This is Fermilab, too. Now, don't forget, these are the two particles that I found in our light research. <laughs> there they are right there. These are the two particles from Fermilab. And they do exactly what they say at Fermilab. That has almost no mass whatsoever, but a lot of burn. That has all the mass and no burn. And these are the two, and they create exactly what they say 
sterile mu mu muons, the muon neutrino and electron neutrino attached together like here, when they separate they create showers from the electrons and the muon just goes on its way to black hole. That's exactly what we got right there. And then they're talking about is empty space empty? Well of course it's not empty, it's just saturated with particles just as they reported back here in 2013. I mean, this has been reported forever. People, that, how could you possibly miss it? It's saturated with dust. But right here it says, empty space isn't empty. It's not empty. It's obviously not. And they show it winking on and off and on and off, like foam and the bubbles popping on and off. Well, the reason it's winking on and off is because all the particles in space are being hit by light every now and then, and then they wink, and then they stop, and they hit, and they wink, and they wink, and they wink, and they wink, and they wink. That's what's going on there. See, it says empty space experiences similar activity, subatomic particles winking in and out of existence. These subatomic particles are real and have a measurable impact on our universe. They're light, first of all. Secondly, saturated with dust out there. We're crazy to think that light doesn't slow down as it comes to us and that the universe is expanding and that's pulling the light up into red. No. Red means it's just slowing down as it hit things. Okay, my friends. It started, really started. Matter from light. Yes, I've shown this. What if this is not empty space? What if space is not empty? PBS space-time, yes, absolutely it's not empty. It's filled with particles. Spectroscopy exp explained. Well, let me see if I can explain it after they try to explain it. Everything now has started to come to fruition. Mud fossils changed everything there is as mud fossils advanced into the light realm to understand how all those particles developed into actual matter, matter from light. Exactly. Let there be light. That's exactly what happened. Let there be matter. Let there be life. That's what light is. It's everything.